What's up, everybody, and welcome to Lacrosse Now. That is Travis Eldridge. I am Tom Eschen, and we are in the thick of things, in the midst of the NCAA tournament. What a great spot to be in. What an awesome weekend of games. We got more coming up this weekend, too, Trav. Yeah, I mean, we went right through Sunday night last weekend, and now we start Thursday with the women's quarterfinals all day. I love that move, by the way. It's to get some more TV exposure, put them on ESPNU all day on Thursday. Awesome, because it just sets the table for what should be uh, one of the best weekends of college lacrosse every year, and uh, we'll be again this year with the women's on Thursday and then the men's and uh, men's quarterfinals uh, Saturday and Sunday. So with the women starting Thursday, we've got three women's guests on the show today. We've got Charlie Campbell from Stony Brook. What a great game they had over the course of uh, two great games over the course of the weekend in goal for the Sea Wolves, and then we've got. Danielle Pavanelli from Florida as well. Travis will speak with her. And Chris Saylor, of course, Princeton knocked out of the tournament, but sort of that end interview just to wrap things up with the Princeton head coach. Travis had a nice conversation with her as well. But we'll, before we get to those interviews, we'll talk about the men's stuff here after what was a pretty close Saturday of games. Sunday was a little bit different. We saw some dominance on Sunday until the very end. Let's start, though, with Saturday. And I'll go, I'll go first, Travis. We'll go back and forth here. I'll go with okay. Princeton BU. This is the first game I want to start with. And for me, the takeaway, that's more like it for Princeton. A team that was third in the rankings for much of the year, kind of scuffled in Ivy League down the stretch there. They allowed 18 goals against Cornell on April 30th, 19 against Harvard the weekend before that. They had beaten BU already 12-7 earlier in that month, and I said no way. And like the way Princeton's given up goals, BU's definitely going to score more than seven. I couldn't have been more wrong in this case. Princeton brought it defensively in this game. I think that was huge for them. They rotated in four or five close defensemen, kind of worked them around, and then decided to really clamp down on that BU offense. They did such a great job. And th that was Princeton's first NCAA tournament game for everybody on that roster. So yeah. to be able to come out and perform so well, that's more like it for the Tigers after they were one of the top five teams pretty much all year long until the very end. Yeah, it felt like their time was at the beginning of the year, and yeah. then they kind of fell off, and especially when they don't make the Ivy League tournament. How crazy is that? The yeah. team that a lot of people thought might have been the best team in the league doesn't even make the tournament. And so everybody, I think, kind of wrote them off and forgot about them for a second. But it was the, hey, don't forget about us. I, I said it before, like these were all the same guys that were part of that team with Michael Sowers that was a top four team in the country in 2020 before the season was shut down. So although you know, Michael Sowers is obviously gone, but a lot of those guys are back and they are determined. They only got uh, older and they got wiser. And that was a really good performance uh, for them against BU this weekend. Yeah, um, it was cool to see. Of course, BU had such a great year and tough to see them end like this. But you could really see the Ivy League, for better or for worse, flex their muscle over the course of this weekend. All right, you're up next, Trap. All right, uh, let's start with just the first game on Sunday. And it's the top team in the country, and they left no questions about whether they are the top team in the country. Yeah, they're playing Vermont, and Vermont was up and down throughout the year. Vermont just closed the, the season really strong in the America East. And yeah, and I will say Vermont didn't have to play Stony Brook in the America East uh, playoffs in the, the postseason because Stony Brook was ineligible, which I think made their road here to the NCAA tournament easier. But don't take anything away from Vermont. They were a good team this year. But Maryland is in a whole different level. For 21-5, to 5, it was the first time that they had uh, reached the 20-goal mark in a NCAA tournament game for Maryland in 46 years. I mean, every, all the knowns did exactly what you expect them to. Uh, Luke Weirman at the faceoff X was great. Wisnowskis was great. McNaney in goal was good. DeMeo was, was terrific offensively. I mean, all the guys, like, you go up and down the list, and it's like all the guys that we've been talking about all year – Got it done. And so now the tournament starts for Maryland. They will talk about Virginia and Brown here in a minute, but now they get Virginia and this is it. Like I, you all, I almost get the feeling that Virginia is the biggest hurdle in their way to winning a championship. Like you, you look at the road to the road and them getting a championship weekend. You got to win two games in three days and that matters. But it feels like for so long, it's been Virginia who's been in their way. And it feels like this is maybe the biggest test of their entire run to run the table and go undefeated for a title. Yeah, and that's where I'll pick things up from there, from that Virginia Brown game, Trav, as the thing I got away from that Virginia Brown game is Virginia – still the two-time defending champs. And that is something we cannot forget. Yeah, the only ACC team to make it, but there's a reason they were the only ACC team to make it. They win 17-10. to 10. This game was tied 
Seven to seven at the half, don't forget. And then Virginia went on that run at the end. 10-3 they won in the second half. An eight-goal run was a part of that. When they started going, it was like, watch out, because this is the Virginia team that we've seen in the NCAA tournament the last couple times around. Yeah, sometimes they scuffled in the regular season this year, but they did that in their past runs too. This is the Virginia with Connor Schellenberger, the most outstanding player from last year's tournament, a big part of that second half run. He had three of the assists in the eight goal run four goals four assists on the day and you know who really stuck out Matthew Nunes he had 16 saves on the day I know maybe there was a couple questions of freshman is, is he ready for the big stage he's ready for it Trav and his performance I know that the offense played really well but his performance against what we had thought was a pretty good Brown offense after going to the Ivy League the way they did was really really good did I not predict this? I did. Did I not say, "Hey, you you look at Brown's losses, and they ran into some goalies that made double digit saves," and, and it's exactly what happened. And you, you got that. That was like the difference maker in him having a, in a big game. Stopped enough of Brown's shots because Brown's got a good offense, but just enough to give Virginia the momentum to go on the run that they did. And and like you get the feeling that that becomes the difference maker for all of these really good teams because when we're going to get down the stretch here, you're going to have offenses that can score. So do you have guys that can get stopped at the other end? It, I think it's one of the things that's made Maryland stand out so much this year because they're great at the faceoff effect, so they're going to win some extra possessions there, but they're going to stop you defensively at the other end, and their offense is so good – that because of that defense making stop, you can't trade goals with them. And that becomes the differences of them going on these four, five, six goal runs that is la- allowing them to blow teams out. Yeah, um, that that will serve them. That will be interesting to see that matchup because, like you said, for Maryland, you know, and Maryland to me, just going back to that real quick, avoided what happened to Georgetown and almost Penn, that kind of first round scare. I know Penn was a little bit of a different story, but Georgetown felt like they were a dominant team to me. And I, I had said this and we talked about it, Trav, and I thought that Georgetown would kind of coast their way through here, but they got into that bit of a mode against Delaware where they weren't blowing them out. Delaware hung around long enough. Maryland left no question against Vermont. And I right. think for them, that's the best possible scenario for them moving forward. Because, you know, you got to be playing well, I think, confident, have one that you don't have to – be so stressed out over it. I know a good battle is always important, but I, I like the fact they blew them out, left no doubt, and they're going to try to do that again against Virginia. We'll talk more about the game on Thursday, but they want to be able to do that again against Virginia, which they did in the regular season too. I mean, it's what stood out about this Maryland team. That made great teams have Even the North Carolina women, like in the ACC tournament, they had a game where it wasn't quite they, – they, one goal win over Notre Dame. It wasn't yeah. quite convincing like you may expect – but that has not happened at all uh, for, for Maryland this year. Uh, all right. Um, but why don't we talk about Georgetown and Delaware? Okay. Huh? Yeah, we can do it. Let's do this. Uh, because the last game on Sunday night saved the maybe the wildest, best we, we saw all weekend. This Delaware team, I said it going in. I did, did I not say keep an eye on this you didn't team predict, going in? Okay. I think you didn't predict. The I didn't. Win. I didn't predict the win. But you gave them a zero <laughs> I, I, percent oh, chance oh, to win the, this I'm game. I'm on the train tracks. I'm done. I, I said I didn't think they had any chance, and you did say they. You said to keep an eye on it. You didn't predict the win, but I am taking the heat for this one, and I'm so happy for Delaware. It could not. What a performance against a great team in Georgetown, and, and I. It, to me, I, I was shocked, but in a, a pleasant way because, like you said, the Blue Hens. They were that kind of team heading into the season, kind of underachieved, found their stride late. And I know this is your game, but it feels like they, they kind of picked up where they left off and, and were able to figure things out in the right, just a nick of time and be able to do it against Georgetown. What an upset. What a win for that program. Yeah, well, and what I wanted to say is, like, I said this about Drexel last year coming out of the CAA tournament. It's that it wasn't just, like, one unit that was really good. Now, a lot of people know this Delaware offense because of what Mike Robinson and Ty Kurtz have done throughout the last couple of years in terms of, like, big performances where somebody scores seven or eight goals. But it's the entire team that has stood out this year and coming down the stretch is playing really well. Like, that defense has a second-team All-American in Owen Grant. And uh, we, I talked to Ben DeLuca, their head coach, earlier uh, today. We're gonna, you can hear that interview on Thursday. But I'm, I told him, I was like, I'm glad the rest of the country gets to see Owen Grant as well, as close as I've seen Owen Grant over the last couple of years. Because he's a big, imposing physical defenseman who's got great takeaway checks, 
who can then also run in transition. We talk about Kobe Smith being a PLL defender. He's a first round pick this year. The next guy that coming out of the CAA is Owen Grant. Like he is going to be a pro defenseman with what we're seeing. And he showed it against Georgetown. Georgetown has some of the best athletes in the country on that midfield and the attack. And he showed it. He was taking it away from some of the best players, all Americans at the other end, Graham Bundy, the rest of them. And so Owen Grant showing that, I think, shows you what he can do defensively. And then how about the story of Matt Kilkiri? Like, he lost his starting job. He came back. Delaware wasn't sure if he was going to come back to school or not. So they went out. They, they have to keep recruiting, figure out who's going to be your goalie. Well, Kilkiri comes back after beating the starter all year last year. He loses his job in competition at the beginning part of the season. Paul Reedy, the freshman, was terrific. Plays them uh, their way to a win over a Big Ten school in Hopkins in the non-conference. And then it's Kilkiri who comes back in in CAA play, earns his job back, and now leads them to not only a CAA title but a NCAA tournament win. Like, you can't write a better story than that. That's unbelievable for, that, for him to lose it and not just go in the can and say, oh, I don't know why I came back. And then earn his way back onto the field and now do this, playing his best lacrosse maybe of his career, is unbelievable. And so him at the defensive end, we know the offense. And then at, at, I, uh, Logan Premtosh, the face-off X, against one of the best face-off units in the country in Georgetown, did just enough to be able to keep Delaware in that game, stop any type of big Georgetown runs, and the Blueheads were able to come from behind and win. And, you know, it's why we love the tournament so much. And uh, you, you spoke to – you're going to speak to Coach DeLuca later on this week. And what struck me was after the game, he went and hugged, I think, almost everyone on that. His team and everybody was celebrating. And that told me a lot about the program because he hugged not only his assistants, not only whoever else it might have been. He was hugging athletic trainers, like not like just running around hugging people. Like you could tell that there's a connection there. When you have a program that right down to the very last person, whoever that might be, is involved and everyone's important, that shows you a lot. And that's why they can win a game like that because you could sense from top to bottom, everybody was all in and everybody appreciated everybody else. I, that, to me, watching that after the game was over really struck i almost got emotional watching that i thought that was so cool yeah and you know what this program he took it over and he's just kind of he's instilled his culture and it's a it's not an easy culture to buy into he is a tough hard-nosed guy and he expects that from his team and he wants these guys to compete and so i mentioned the goalie battle like there are a lot of coaches that wouldn't feel comfortable doing that because you got an incumbent who's going to be a fifth year senior but he wants the best guys to play. He wants the cream to rise to the top. And you, I think you, you mentioned, uh, we, we were texting during this game, Drew Linkitis, the midfielder, who had, had, when I was getting ready to do their game against Hopkins, had four points on the season. And that was like seven games in. He had done nothing. He was barely on the second line midfield. He was like a second kind of third team guy, third uh, line guy. Now, all of a sudden, by the end of the CAA tournament, he's a first-line guy, and now he is maybe their best midfielder in an NCAA tournament game. And I think it shows you exactly what he wants in terms of culture. He wants guys to be challenged. He wants to have the best guys continue to get better, and he wants the best guys to be playing on here down the stretch. And that, I think that shows you exactly how a guy has gotten better throughout the year and is now playing his best lacrosse at the end. And you have the, the cool, one of the better stories of the weekend coming up. They're playing Cornell. And, and Cornell goes out, and they handled Ohio State for sure. I mean, Chase Erlins had full field goals. That was a 15-8 win. And uh, so you got now that Cornell matchup to me. You know, Cornell, like, okay, they're, they're, they're back, and, and they can compete with the best of them here at this time of year. Well, and think about this. The last time Cornell went to the Final Four, was under head coach Ben DeLuca yeah. back in 2013 when they played an epic game against Duke, lost in the national semifinal. So how how fitting is this that either Ben DeLuca is going to be taking a team as his as head coach to the Final Four uh, for the first time since then, or the team that he coached back then is going to go back there for the first time since. But let's talk about this uh, Cornell win over Ohio State because for the second time this year, they dig themselves into a big hole. It was 3 mm -hmm. uh Ohio State during the regular season. 4 nothing here, Ohio State, the tournament. They get that weather delay, and it was like things – it's like they got struck by lightning or something. <laughs> like things just completely flipped, and they go on that six- or seven-goal run, I believe. Uh, C.J. Kirst helping lead the way with, with seven goals overall. And 
that uh, to, to me was it's just so surprising because you know what Ohio State is all about under head coach Nick Myers. So I think it says you tells you a lot about this Cornell team to be able to do that against a well-coached team under Nick Myers and uh, Gavin Adler once again showing you why he is a first-team All-American uh, defenseman because once again he had locked down Jack Myers. He got a, a few more points than he did in the, the regular season meeting, but not much. I think he finished with three. And it, similar to what Delaware did against Georgetown, it is a full field effort for Cornell. Like they've got great players at attack. They've got a solid unit in the midfield. They've got a terrific defense. And Chase Erland is now starting to play, I think, his best lacrosse here at the end of the year. So all up and down, they are a full, complete team that, like, you're not, there's not a, I don't think there's a piece of Cornell you can pick at. They're all really good. You just got to kind of, it's it, you know, like you kind of try to find your matchups, but there's not like one unit or one part of the field that you can take advantage of with Cornell. They're they're a sound team. And there were some, and I know Harvard lost. We'll talk about that in a second. There were some questioning some of the Ivy League teams, you know, just in terms of, oh, were they really that good just because they won some out of conference games early? You know, another example is that Cornell dominance over Ohio State. This wasn't an upset. This wasn't a very close game, um, especially in the second half. It was just an example that the Ivy League, yes, was as advertised this year and we'll see how many teams can make it a championship weekend. All right. Um, well, of- I mean, hold, hold on real quick. How fitting was it that it was that Ohio State, uh, Cornell went over Ohio State, I think, in the regular season that I think put the Ivy League kind of st- along with the Princeton, whatever, Georgetown, that stamped them on the map. And it's this one that I think validates why there were so many Ivy League teams in this tournament. Right. I don't think they were all going to win, but most of them did. So no. I, you can't you can't dispute that. Um, let's get to one of the, the closest games was the Penn-Richmond game, Travis. And that was 11 to 10. And my mantra for this one was, sounds about right. <laughs> you know, for a team in Penn, I went over it. One goal wins against Duke in overtime. Penn State, Villanova, St. Joe's in overtime. Went back a year, 2020, or two years, I guess. Five games, they went two and three. All were decided by three goals or less. Went back another year to 2019. They were four and three in one-goal games. They played seven one-goal games that year, and they won the Ivy League title then, too. So this for Penn sounds about right. They win close games. Freshman attacker Ben Smith, game tying goal 29 seconds to go. Game winner in overtime. He had five goals and assists. This kid has 17 goals in the last six games. So Penn just keeps on coming at you, and I love that. That's what's fascinating about the Ivy League this year. Guys that might not have done much as freshmen in the first few games of the season, all of a sudden, they're figuring it out. So Penn now has this whole other arsenal of guys coming in, and some of these other Ivy League teams do. But it's really cool to see now these guys that you always hear coaches say, oh, they're not freshmen anymore. They're not. And now you're seeing that come to fruition. And Penn winning a really close battle. Richmond, you could tell they were battle-tested. They had won outright that game against Virginia earlier in the year, played in a tough SoCon conference, gave them everything they had against a Penn team. A lot of people saw in the Ivy League and said, well, this is a championship contender almost knocked out by Richmond in the first round. If there were two teams that showed that they certainly deserve to be at the dance, like people talk about the AQ and it's like, oh, well, when Notre Dame and Duke aren't here, so we don't have the best 16 teams left. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're picking on Richmond or St. Joe's, like all we got to do, we'll talk about the St. Joe's deal game here in a second. Should, look what they did here in the first round. They, uh, they didn't just belong here. They could compete here. And Richmond was a really good team all year, as was Jacksonville, by the way. Because I think you put Jacksonville in this spot, and they're challenging somebody in this first round, too. I, this, it shows you just the parity of what college lacrosse has become. You've got great players going all over the place because they can play, and they're going to play right away. And when those great players get to be seniors and fifth-year guys like Ryan Lanchberry, who's a uh, – under Armour All-American that decided to go to Richmond instead and stay there. Like, this is what happens. And I I thought uh, they really showed that they could play. But back to Penn, I mean, think about this a couple weeks ago. It was was the week before the Ivy League tournament. They are down big to St. Joe's at home on that same field that they just won on, by the way, at Penn Park. They're down big at home. They do. They go on this unbelievable comeback in the fourth quarter, which felt like at the time they have saved their at-large hopes because at that point you weren't thinking Penn was going to win the Ivy League because they were weren't even sure they were going to be in the tournament. And so, how different we're talking about Penn now as a possible Final Four and even championship team after what they did in the Ivy League tournament. But I remember thinking about that St. Joe's Penn game, thinking. 
I don't know. There's no way Penn's going to the Final Four. Not if they do this. And it, uh, just how much things can change with a couple of results over a couple of weeks. And I think we learned in that day how good St. Joe's is. And uh, we'll get into that, that too. In a little bit here. Penn will take on Rutgers, who had one of the more impressive performances, dominant at that over the weekend, Trav. Yeah, my headline for this was just Scarlet Knights shine because all of the things that I think could go right for Rutgers did go right. Like this program, and outside of the, some of the weather delays that caused some TV issues with like when this game was going to actually start, um, I mean, just like everything was perfect. Like the crowd, by the way, can we start playing more games outside the football stadium? Like the crowd was the biggest we had all weekend in any game. It was at Rut is this Rutgers Harvard game, which is awesome. Ross Scott goes off, yeah. and he, I, I didn't. I know you said like maybe he wasn't the dude earlier this season. I think he's proven to be the dude for Rutgers. Like he is their guy, and they've got a lot of other great pieces around him. But he's their number one, and he's showing that he's their number one. And um, I just it, like. They they took care of business against Harvard. I thought they would win. I don't know if I thought they would win this convincingly. But just in terms of Ross Scott being great, the crowd being awesome, putting like your best foot forward on a big uh, on on display at, at home on a big stage. I thought everything nothing could have gone better for Rutgers this weekend. You know. And it's interesting how Rutgers put this team together. And I wasn't sure. Maybe, maybe it took me too long to get on the bandwagon. Probably did. But I wasn't sure until I saw them play Harvard. I was like, oh, this is what it's all about. And, yeah, they didn't go out like Maryland and get some of those top-tier transfers for one reason or another. But they got guys that built their depth. And they built the offense around. I know you mentioned Ross Scott, but they have a lot of options offensively, the way they've been able to build that and build this program in that way, too. And I think that's what you see now these days. Programs, yeah, a lot of teams are similar at the top. It's a matter of how do you build your program from the top down. And Rutgers, you know, backing up what they did last year this time around again to me is really impressive. And congratulations to Brian Brecht for really doing a lot with that program. And uh, now look at them again. They're in position once again to try and get in the championship weekend like they were last year, just one goal away. Yeah, and I, I think you have to remember, as much as they were headline transfers for Maryland, like think about the guys that are still there that are the leaders. Like Logan Wisnowskis, Anthony DeMeo, Logan True. McNaney, yeah. and Goal. Those are the guys. It just happens that the role guys now that they brought in are also guys who were stars elsewhere. But like if you're going to be successful in the transfer portal, I do think you still have to have a culture and locker room of guys that are your established guys, and then you're just adding supplements to them. They can be like high-end supplements, which are great, but like they just have they have to be supplemental additions. They can't you can't just bring in a whole group of guys and expect that to be a, a change a, a difference makers. You you've got to kind of supplement what you already have, and you have to have your established culture and find guys they're going to fit to that culture. And I think that's what Brian Brecht has done, and I think that uh, is what Maryland has done as well. Well, and, and I thought, and I'm surprised you didn't say this, but Rutgers lost their guys. I mean, Maryland added on to the guys true. that have already been there. Rutgers lost the guys that have been. Charlton Bees was for that program for eight years, whatever. And he's not there anymore, yet they built through the transfer portal some depth and were able to get these other guys to take the next step, which I think is really cool. But if you ask Brian Brecht, he'll say, these are Rutgers guys. These are Rutgers guys. They, we, he's like, we don't. when I talk to him about the transfer portal, he's like, we're not we're not recruiting a guy that doesn't know where Rutgers is. Like somebody who we're bringing in knows exactly what Rutgers lacrosse is all about. <laughs> it's true. Uh, we got well, one more game, right? Uh, we, uh, yeah. What do you, you got? One J Yale St. Joe's and yes, um, all, this game was awesome. Yeah, I, I call it survive and advance. I think. I mean, I, you could say that with Penn too over Richmond, but Yale against St. Joe's uh, that was a survival and an advance type game. We'll talk. You'll hear my conversation with Matt Brandall later on this week. And he goes, yeah. He goes, St. Joe's taught us a lot, man. He goes, we didn't, you know, they are a really good team, and we learned a lot of things. I mean, that was a tie game, 15-15 with 7.25 to go, and Yell scores three of the last four to win that one. Yell turned the ball over 21 times in this game, and it shows you just how important goalies are this time of year. Paquette had 16 saves on the day. So, Yale, a team I think a lot of people, and we have been high on all year long, surviving a, t a team against a, a game against St. Joe's in which, of course, you don't win the majority of the faceoff. St. Joe's won two of the three pretty much every single time out. 
And uh, I think for Yale to be able to survive this and move on to the next game in which they'll play Princeton once again is, is very good for them. And I think maybe this could be a lesson for them moving forward. Kind of the way Penn got the lesson against St. Joe's in the regular season. Yale got that lesson here in the postseason. And Matt Branda and Johnson, once again, were the two guys, four goals, two assists. And they've been able to find their youth and work with some of those young freshmen and build on up. And, and Yale, once again, I mean, don't forget the last time they were in this tournament, they went to the championship. We can't forget that either. We talk about Virginia being nope. defending champs. Last time Yale was in this, they went to the title game. Yeah, and, and they're still battle-tested. They got a lot of new pieces and some freshmen and first and second-year guys who have never done this before. So there's, there's some different pieces out there. But this is still a team that knows what it's like to play this time of year. I, you do have to give a lot of credit to St. Joe's because whether it was that Penn game to the end of the regular season or what they did here in the NCAA tournament, Taylor Ray's squad – played big boy lacrosse like they Penn and Yale are two of the most athletic teams in the country and to go toe to toe with them not like do some kind of fluky thing that throws these teams off their game like they go they went toe to toe with both of these programs athlete on athlete and showed that they can hang so all the credit in the world to this Hawks program for what they did but now it's a chance for Yale to show hey we are a team that uh, can that remembers how to, what it's like to play this time of year, and I wonder how much that experience gives them an edge. Maybe this weekend against Princeton, just knowing that Princeton doesn't have guys who have been there, while Yale does. Like Yale has the experience of knowing what it's like to play this lacrosse this time of year. Pen, uh, uh, excuse me, Princeton does not. Um, we'll delve deeper into these matchups on Thursday. I will say Yale's won six in a row against Princeton, won the first meeting 14-12 to 12 back in March. So something to think about as we look ahead to those games. And we need to look ahead to the women's games now, Travis, because yes. Thursday is when everything starts here. We got some great matchups, and I think the, one of the biggest ones of the weekend is going to be North Carolina Stony Brook, just like it was last year. Um, uh, obviously, we know UNC far and away seems like the best team, but Stony Brook – more familiar with them now. It feels like they they can compete if they can play their game. I, I like Stony Brook a lot. I just, you know, how can you keep up? How do you go and keep on coming at a North Carolina team who doesn't stop? Well, I think the number one key is the player we're about to hear from that you spoke to earlier today, Charlie Campbell. Mm-hmm. Like She had 12 saves in that uh, second round win over the weekend uh, on Sunday. That was a tied or set an NCAA game record for a Stony Brook goalie for saves. She's going to have to set the record if Stony Brook's going to win. Like, she, I think, 15, 16, 17 saves. Like, she has to be that good because you need to get stops. Because Carolina, as good as Stony Brook's offense is, Carolina's going to find a way to get stops. The question is, then, can you get your own to be able to keep pace? And so I think defensively for Stony Brook and Charlie and Campbell and goal, as big of a key as the offense. Yeah, um, defensively, Haley Dillon has been really good for Stony Brook. I think she's gone a little unheralded. Top five in the country and caused turnovers. Claire Levy, I mean, Joe Spolina talks about her, says she's a top five defender in the country. She is as athletic as they come, which is exactly what you need against a Carolina team that moves so well with and without the ball, with all the athletes they have on offense. And Raina Sabella, one of those glue people that does a little bit of everything. I know, of course, you hear about Ellie Macera, Kaylin Hart on the offensive end. But like you said, Travis, it's the defense for Stony Brook that needs to string together stops. But if you don't string together stops, you got to get every other stop because you can't let North Carolina go one, two, three, four, five, just like you saw with Virginia and that first – I mean – the perform- I don't know if I've ever seen anything like it. In an NCAA tournament game against Virginia, North Carolina went up, what, 15, 16, nothing, something like that, ridiculous, and it wasn't even close against a conference foe in the NCAA tournament. That should have sent the message to everybody. But I don't think Stony Brook, a team from Long Island, a Joe Spolina coach team, they're going to be afraid of anything. You know what I mean? They, that Carolina ended their season last year. The only problem is Virginia certainly wasn't intimidated. Virginia has played North Carolina how many times over the last couple of years? And they still went in there, got beat 24 to 2, Tom. Yeah, I know. 24 to 2. I know. Yeah, I know. I, they're different caliber teams, Virginia and Stony Brook this True. year, too. They're, yeah, but I, that, 
that score that score was eye popping. And then you look at the stats and like how well spread out. Like the shooting for North Carolina was unbelievable. They like everybody shot like over 70, 80 percent. Like they didn't miss. Yeah. Um they're they're scary when they're going right. And we saw that against Duke, I believe, as well after in that one of those final regular season games after Duke had just beat Boston yeah. College. North Carolina's like, hey guys, don't, don't forget about or not that you forgot about us, but this is what it's all about. Um, I, it should be – I would love to see another competition because we saw the second time around last year Stony Brook really battled. That was the best game until the Final Four. The North Carolina, that was the most competitive game that they had had all season long. And, uh, you know, at this point, I mean, Stony Brook – could be primed to do that again. I don't know if they're going to upset them, but I think they're going to make it fun. And I think that's what it's all about. As a program that deserved the better draw. Unfortunately, they don't get it. But you got to play, you got to play. And Stony Brook will take on Carolina. Um, all right, so yeah, I did speak with uh, Charlie Campbell. Let's take a look at that interview now. So we bring in the Stony Brook goalie now, Charlie Campbell, and also the USILA Division I Women's Player of the Week. Congratulations, Charlie. I mean, what was rolling? What was working so well for you guys this weekend? Oh, my goodness. I mean, my first of all, my team is incredible. So <laughs> that always works well for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we just, I mean, we worked so hard and uh, you know, a lot of people were saying, you know, we had a week off and was that going to hurt us because we weren't able to uh, play it in the uh, conference tournament for the AEC, which, you know, was, you know, that can really hurt people. I mean, look what happens to the Packers every postseason. They get a week off and then they get upset. You know, yeah. it's, it can <laughs> that really bye week can hurt. Yeah, you're right. It can really hurt people. But I, we just, you know, Coach Polita said, you guys got to keep staying focused. And, you know, we wanted it so badly. And, you know, there's something just so magical and amazing playing, you know, in front of a Long Island home crowd at Kenny P and it, we just felt so energized and so determined. And, you know, we knew both of those games were going to be, you know, dog fights mm. and we were, we were prepared for that. You know, we had, we had a really slow start against Drexel to be fair, but then we were able to come out and just like keep everything together. And I'm just, I'm so proud of us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Drexel, I mean, they have a good offense. We have them in the CAA, of course. We do their games all year long, and I did the championship game. And their offense, they're, they're very veteran-laden. They're very talented. You only scored four goals against you guys. You had nine saves in that game, I believe. And then you have Rutgers, who went and beat Northwestern in the tournament. I mean, in their, their, their tournament. I mean, those are two really quality wins and the biggest moment. That's got to be really cool for you guys. Yeah, it's, it's so exciting. I'm so freaking thrilled for us, to be honest with you. I just, I, I can't even, I'm not normally speechless, but I'm just speechless. <laughs> we, we played out of our minds because we knew what, that we were, we were capable of beating those teams, but only if we stuck to our game plan and we worked hard enough and we gritted it out. We, none of the, neither of those games were going to be handed to us. Right, and, and you had to go and win them, right? And, and you know, no matter what the path is, I'm sure you talked about that in the past. We've heard all about it. I mean, you have to play the teams in front of you to get to the end of the line, right? I feel like that's probably the talk in the locker room, I can imagine, and when you guys are ta talking about this and whatever it might be heading into games like that. Definitely. It's, it's win one, earn one. And, you know, we're in the NCAA tournament. We are in the postseason. No team is bad. We all deserve to be here. So – to, you know, go into any game, like not giving your opponent the full respect that they deserve was something that we, we very much want to make sure we, we, you know, we gave them their full respect, but we weren't scared. Yeah. And that was the balance we were striking. So, and I, I'm curious, obviously you're a newcomer to this program for the last year or so. <laughs> and um, you walk in and you know, you know, this, program Stony Brook they've gotten closer and closer it feels like on a yearly basis to getting over that hump and getting in the championship weekend mm -hmm. how much is that talked about is that a focus and your goals like what is the vibe when it comes to that mentality amongst the program oh day one our goal is win a national championship mm -hmm. and whatever we have to do whatever we have to give to get there we will that's that was what we agreed upon the first day you walk into the locker room. And that is the the contract that we followed all throughout this year. And we you know, we hit bumps in the road, but we came back hmm. and now we're fighting for our lives. But so is every other team. 
And isn't that such a wonderful thing that everyone's giving their best effort and giving you their best lacrosse? It's just so great. Yeah, and that's what makes it fun because you can see the desperation, right, in every single athlete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I think. Yeah, it's, I mean, I feel like I'm going to go in cardiac arrest half the time, but yes, it's also fun. <laughs> you've, been, you've been pretty composed on the field. And I wanted to ask you about that because obviously you have the career at Virginia. You know, you finish what, sixth most saves all time there. You come over. This is your sixth year, right, in college? Yes. I am old. <laughs> <laughs> not old yet. Not old enough because you've still got eligibility, <laughs> at yeah. least at the end of this year. Um, but you come in into a program, obviously, we talked about so successful, so deep, you know, even at the goalie position with Cameron in there. And she obviously such a talented goalie at that for Team Canada. I mean, you walk in and, you know, you probably didn't really know maybe where you stood or whatever. I guess for you, what was the mentality of walking into this program and, and now you're starting for this program? I mean, I want to play as much as other people want to breathe. That's just how it is. And I, I am not the typical athlete shape. <laughs> um, most goalies aren't. <laughs> but um, I just, I really blessed growing up with amazing coaches and, but in particular, my parents going, if you want something, we'll support you, but you have to work as hard as you physically can to get there. We will support, we will drive you to all the Yellow Jackets practice. We will drive you to tryouts. We will drive you to every single camp, but you have to put in the work at the end of the day. And I was, I mean, like, I don't, I don't think it's silly to say that I was scared or nervous walking in because it's Stony Brook. Mm. This, this is a program that was, you know, ranked above where I had been. You know, yeah. I was in the ACC, but, you know, Stony Brook was that upper echelon that I, I wanted to get to. And I knew it was Long Island across, which <laughs> meant very physical, very tough, very gritty with no sorries if someone hits you in the head. <laughs> and um, I, I think it's fair to say that I, I was definitely nervous, but I was I was so hopeful and excited to see what I could do when put into a crucible like that. Mm. And you've been able to do it. I guess. Now you looked at it, look at where you are now. Is that kind of surreal? You know, I, um, I was talking to my parents the other week and before I came here, like I've never won anything. Hmm. And at the end of this season, you know, getting accolades, you know, something that I had never really gotten before, like, you know, end of the season accolades. Yeah. It was just, you know, I stood there and I was like, I have something to show my kids now. Like I, I have proof that I was good at lacrosse and I'm so excited about that. But there's also like, you know, when I'm in a game, I just, I black out. I couldn't tell you how many saves I had. All I want to do is, is win because my team deserves it so much. And I know how hard they've worked. And I, I don't think that I look at me necessarily. I think I look at my, the, my team and the group around me. That's what I see. And that's what I'm so proud of. And I just keep, you know, looking at how amazing my teammates are and being like, I need to be better because I'm not even close to how good they are. You, well, I, you could say, I mean, they did the, the experts said you were the best player after the first round of the NCAA, uh, first two rounds of the NCAA play tournament. So and I think that. that was very kind of them to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's an accolade you can tell your kids for a long, long time down the road. <laughs> I'm not giving it back. No, I exactly. <laughs> and you don't have to, you don't have to for sure. Um, you know, we, you've been obviously around 2017 was your freshman year at Virginia, right? Yes, 20, yeah, I graduated high school in 2016, so the 2016 to 2017 school year. So, so uh, what's still different. motivating you, you know, in year six? What has been the thing that's driven you to work hard, as you just mentioned, to, to fight every single day? I just, lacrosse is my greatest source of joy. I can't, I can't describe it. I, I don't know. I don't know if, I, I can't find an analogy that works for everyone, but like, the the most intense beautiful purest passion that you have that's lacrosse for me and i know that at the end of this month no matter what happens i'm hanging on my cleats and that's terrifying number one because this is some you know 
I am, I'm, hi, I'm Charlie and I'm a goalie. I've introduced myself that way for 15, 16 years now, however long I've been playing. And it's just such an intrinsic part of who I am. And it's what, like that sense of accomplishment and that joy that it gives me, but also doing something with a group of people and believing in them and having them believe in you is just such a beautiful and precious thing that, you know, I don't think everyone gets to feel in their lifetime, but I do. I just want to hold on to it for as long as I can, you know? It's rare, right? That's what it kind of makes me think. All that, all that is rare, what you just talked about. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know. I, I can't really describe how lacrosse just fills my entire heart and my entire soul. And the fact that I get to be surrounded by people who it fills their entire heart as well. And we can all just like care and run around together. And that's just, it's such a beautiful thing. And it's, it's just such a precious thing. And I know that I may have opportunities to feel something close to that again, but it, it'll never be quite the same as, you know, collegiate athletics together right now. I hope you're going to do something with lacrosse when it's all said and done after this. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm, I coach actually for my old travel team, the Long Island Yellow Jackets. So, okay. and you know, with a younger group of girls, which is fantastic. Cause you know, you ask them, what do you like about the sport? And one of them will be like wearing matching scrunchies. And the other one will be like scoring a goal, which I just think it's just that pure level of like being interested in the sport, which I love. Yeah. But, um, I, there's just, it's just so magical. I'm holding on to it for as long as I can. What, what's it like when you and Tracy Weiner get together? Because before I talk <laughs> to you, Charlie, I thought she loved lacrosse more than anybody. You might give her a run for the money. Nah, Coach Weiner, I'm sure, <laughs> has me beat. I'm sure. Freaking love Coach Weiner, though. <laughs> I'm sure. What a lady. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're two great ambassadors for the sport. Your love for the game obviously pours out of both of you. All right, let's get to brass tacks here. You got North Carolina. Um, yes, you know, sir. obviously that offense, the depth, and uh, knowing that North Carolina is a team that ended Stony Brook season last year. Of course, you were with Virginia at that time. What's the mentality heading into Thursday? Well, I think it's physically impossible to go to UNC and have a false sense of confidence hmm. because they are that incredible. Um, they have it's been described as just an embarrassment of riches at how talented that team is. It's, it's an all-star look looking team, you know, especially with all the, the transfers yeah. and stuff like that. I oh, we're just so excited. We're so excited to see what we can do. Mm. And um, I know obviously I wasn't here, but you know, UNC ended careers of beloved players at Stony Brook and I didn't play in college with Taryn or Allie, but they were both on my travel team. So yeah. I love them and I hurt for them. I know it's not quite the same cause I wasn't here, but yeah. completely empathize with how everyone's feeling like, you know, the, these stars, you know, didn't get to rocket into the stratosphere as much as we would have liked. And so there's, there's a thirst for vengeance, but it's also just, <laughs> We're so excited to see what we can do. And you have a lot of familiarity there. We were talking about it before the <laughs> interview. You have, I mean, you've been the Dorrance Field you, uh, while playing with Virginia. You've played a lot of games there. I'm sure that, that there's some comfort in that for you as well, I'd imagine. Comfort in Dorrance Field? I, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know yeah. about that. But <laughs> yeah, yes, I've, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have played at Dorrance Field more than any athlete who does not play at UNC should have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, the ACC tournament was there, you know, it felt every year, it just felt like we went to UNC, it never felt like they came to Klockner. Yeah, <laughs> but <right. laughs> um, yeah, I definitely, I know the surface and I did spend most of my collegiate career playing on grass because UVA, if anyone was unaware, has grass facilities. Yeah. Um, so your team, Stony Brook, what do you have to do? What will make your team stand out in that game? You know, what has to go right for you guys to win? Everything. If we play how we can play, we'll win. But if UNC plays how UNC can play and we don't play how we can play, they'll win. Simple as that. It's time to put your money where your mouth is, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, if we can go in there 
with no fear, with respect, but with no fear. And we play how I know all those girls can play. We'll win. That'll be fun to watch. And you'll be under the lights, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Prime time, Charlie. A yeah. big spot for you, right? That's what it's all about. Everyone who watches lacrosse is going to be tuning into that game. I know. I'm not going to miss that. Absolutely not. I know that no. for sure. Um, we appreciate your time. Congratulations once again on the outstanding season so far. The you, the um, the player of the week in the USILA for the women, incredible accomplishment so far. Like I keep on saying so far because I know there's <laughs> more to tackle here, Charlie. But thank you for your time. Good luck on Thursday, okay? Thank you so much. I'm just so blessed to be here. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> We've loved having you. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. So, yeah, Travis, I was joking with them, you know, you and Tracy Weiner. I don't know who has more love for lacrosse because I can't imagine being in the same room with both at the same time because I love lacrosse more just talking to Charlie. Yeah, both of them just light up your day. Like you, you spend time with them talking about lacrosse and you just feel better about the sport and the about, world. About yourself. <laughs> you know, it's just like that oh. too. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know who loves that more, but I, I got to love something as much as Charlie loves lacrosse. I know that for sure in life, which is a good lesson. I can't yeah. wait to see them in action and um, really fun. And that, that team, it seems like they, they've got a really good culture there. Of course, they do with Joe Spillane at the head of things. So. Um, can't wait for that game under the lights on Thursday at Dorrance. All right, um, let's move on here. The two seed Maryland taking on Florida. We talked a lot about, you know, Carolina's dominance in the first round, in the first weekend of the tournament, Travis. Maryland against Duke, similar kind of statement they Big. made. Yeah, I mean, it was an impressive 19 to 6 win against a Duke team that's dominated and scored as many goals as anybody else at times in the country this year. Just six goals against Maryland. I think Maryland showed us what they're made of top to bottom. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things stat wise to come out of this game is that Emily Sterling, Maryland's terrific goalie, only had to make, uh, what was it, six, four saves. She only saw 10 shots for Duke, yeah. which I think tells you a lot about the defense for Maryland in front of Sterling. Like, we've talked a lot about Sterling, and there have been games this year where she has been the reason that they've won. But the defense in front of her didn't give this a potent Duke offense a lot to handle. And so I think that says a lot about this team. And then you look at uh, they do that where they win 19-6 to with Aurora accordingly, only with a goal and an assist. So I'll be interested to see now against Florida what this Maryland offense looks like because in the first meeting, Maryland won by 10, 18 to 8 against the Gators. Accordingly went off. She had 10 points in that game, four goals, six assists, one of the biggest games of her season. I'll be interested to see how does Florida defend her knowing what she did to you the first time. And the rest of the Maryland offense, I feel like, has taken a huge step forward since they played all the way back to the beginning part of the season. So I'll be interested to see what do the Gators try to do defensively to limit uh, Maryland's offense because both ends of the field for Maryland, they are showing that they are a complete team. Yeah, Jordan Lipkin had three goals and an assist for Maryland in this game. One of the more talented ath athletes on that Maryland squad. If she starts peaking at the right time, it could get kind of scary for that offense. And, and on defense, Aiden Paduzzi, four goals, three cause turnovers. Like you said, Travis, the defense just didn't let Duke shoot which I think is yeah. number one. And you have an offense in Florida, kind of that two-tiered system that you kind of have with Duke, too, with Lapinto and Pavanelli, and then you know, Liz Harrison on the draw as well. But I, I want really curious to see how Florida plans on going after um, Maryland in that way. With, with Lopinto and Pavanelli, young talents at that, a freshman and a sophomore, but really talented at that as well. I mean, almost to the caliber of, of those Duke players. So I'm, I can't wait to see what Florida does in this spot. Still really young. Harrison also is a sophomore for them too. So if Florida can make this more of a game, I think that they could be really happy with that moving forward for their program because they've got a lot of young talent. It's just Maryland is looking like they are starting to really, really hum at this time of year, as they normally do. I don't know why we're so surprised about it no we shouldn't be surprised at all and i think that was one of the things i highlighted just like the young talent for florida how do you step up sometimes it's good sometimes you just kind of play it's like what you don't uh know kind of works out well for you and you're in your favor and you just go out there you play unbelievable and you, you beat your your matchups sometimes it doesn't work out that way so i'll be interested to, to see how that plays out uh, but one of those young players is danielle pavanelli for florida i had a chance to catch up with her earlier today 
So getting ready for that big quarterfinal matchup on Thursday, we've got Danielle Papinelli from Florida joining us now. Uh, Danielle, second year in a row for you as a sophomore being back in the quarterfinals. Obviously, this is like the game to get you to championship weekend. What did you learn from last year's experience being here when you lost to Syracuse now the second time around? Yeah, I think the most important thing that we've learned from last year is we got to come out really strong. I think um, last year we came like a little slow. We let Syracuse kind of get like the lead in the beginning. So I think coming out strong and aggressive in the first half will be huge for us and get that momentum going and carry on throughout the rest of the game. For you, that, that team last year had so many veteran leaders who have been around four, five, six years. It, now with such a, a younger offense, especially, how has your role changed as just a sophomore? I mean, yeah, we lost so many great players last year. So I think that this season, I knew I really had to step up my game and do different things, become more of a goal scorer, more of an assister, um, because those roles had to be filled. And so just taking more responsibility on the offensive side um, was just uh, huge for me this season. I knew I had to take the job. What do you take away from that first meeting with Maryland earlier this year? Um, I mean, that was early on the season. So I think we're a completely different team than we were um, when we first played them. So I think that was just a huge learning experience for us. And that'll really help us the second time around, just learning from our mistakes last time and being able to polish those up and work on them and then show them out in the field on Thursday. So for you, what's clicking offensively? You got four plus goals in three straight games, biggest time of the year. What's working? Um, I think our offense just works really well together. I, Emma Lapinto, Ashley Gonzalez, Maggie Hall, we just really work well. And I think we can read each other really well. So being, being able to create those opportunities for one another and if they're assisting to me and I'm getting the goals or opposite, um, we just really know how to work the ball and just get those open looks and finish them. I know you're not alone in that Long Island at Gainesville pipeline that you got going on, but what's the biggest adjustment going from Long Island to now living in Florida? I mean, definitely the weather. Um, <laughs> it gets it gets brutal down here sometimes, just a little humid. But I mean, I can't complain. It gets sunshine all year round. So yeah, I mean, your sister Allie obviously went there. How big of an impact was that in your decision to play for the Gators? I mean, it was huge. Um, just going down there every weekend, seeing her play, like that's where I really grew to love Florida and just love the atmosphere and the team there. So I think that was a huge part of me wanting to come here as well and just live on like the legacy that she left here. Yeah. And you're like, I'm going to Florida in February and I can't imagine still being on Long Island, right? <laughs> can't wait to get back to the sun and the, <laughs> it's so nice down here. So I can't complain about the weather. All right. I'll leave you with this one. Uh, we were talking with Sarah Resnick and she was talking about all the cool experiences you guys have, uh, like all the other sporting events there in Florida, because it's a big athletic department. What's the coolest game or event you've been to outside of lacrosse there in Florida? The coolest game I've been to. Well, actually, I think the coolest game I've been to was during our um, committed, our official visit. And that was when they played, it was a football game. Florida played FSU, um, LSU, sorry. And they made a huge comeback and then they ended up winning with a touchdown and during like late in the fourth quarter. And it was just the most crazy experience. And like, that's when I like, was like, wow, I can't believe I get to come here. And it was just awesome. They brought you in for the right weekend to make yeah. sure you were going to be a Gator. <laughs> yep. Danielle, we appreciate the time. Good luck here on Thursday. Can't wait to see you guys in action and uh, safe travels. We'll talk sometime down the road. Thank you so much. Have a good one. So thanks to Danielle for uh, taking some time. I mean, a different looking team that she was part of last year, especially offensively with all those veteran pieces that were there. But uh, kind of pick it up where that veteran team left off because they're back here in the quarterfinals for the second straight year. Lost to Syracuse last year, trying to change the uh, result here against Maryland on Thursday. Yeah, uh, should be very interesting for sure. Um, all right, let's move on. Continue our previews of the women's quarterfinals coming up this weekend. Loyola at Boston College, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. This should be interesting, Travis, as uh, – BC and Denver, that was kind of a grinded out. It was amazing to watch Denver in that game because they slowed things down as much as possible. As they took 26 shots, 
BC only took 17, and, and I know they were very, very efficient in that, but Denver definitely played to their style, and it, it lent itself to a little bit closer of a game between them and the Eagles. It kept it close for sure, though I will say that the Denver goalies didn't record a save in this game. So BC made everything <laughs> they shot. So you can slow it yeah. down, but BC is still good enough where they can shoot and score. Yeah, a couple of things that I take away from that one. Um, one, for Rachel Hall, maybe it was a result that she needed because she made eight saves in that game. And we haven't seen her make a whole lot of saves at times this year. And I do think that maybe that's the start of her starting to feel like her, like they talk about playoff P, you know, swaggy P in the NBA. Maybe we've got playoff Rachel Hall and I she's agree. like ready to go for a final four run. Like I, I do feel like that's a huge confidence boost for her. And the fact that uh, Charlotte North, maybe it's her time again. She goes off for four goals. You mentioned the shooting. I think she shot four of five, 80% against Denver, had an assist as well. I mean, those two pieces are the pieces that, because all the other pieces are, are integral and key. But if Charlotte North and Rachel Hall are great, or either ends, all the other pieces I trust to, to fill in the gaps. But if they're great, they're, those are the difference makers to them winning a championship and them just maybe making championship weekend or losing this weekend or whatever. And you know, this is where, you know, we talk about double digit saves or whatever you have you. They were eight really good saves for Rachel Hall. I think there was maybe one or two that were at her, but the other saves she made were Excellent. And like you said, this is playoff Rachel Hall, and that's where Boston College gets scary. When she starts stopping yep. shots, when she gets on a roll, because we saw it in the tournament last year, that's when Boston College becomes unstoppable pretty quickly because everybody else has gotten better. You, you know what I mean? If if she is Rachel Hall of the postseason a year ago, watch out because you, you, you don't know what's going to happen. I will say – Loyola is going to pose a challenge here because if Loyola sure. does a, I don't know if they can play the same game type of game that Denver because Loyola is such a I don't think they do. Team, but they're going to have yeah. to try and do something similar and they will be probably a little more efficient when it comes to their shooting and stopping because of the athletes they have on that field on that team. They were the fourth best scoring offense in the country this year for a reason. They've got loads of weapons. Rosenzweig maybe should have gotten a little bit more attention to Wartan wise this year too. We can't forget about her um, for a really good Loyola team. But I think if Loyola can play, they're not going to play the Denver style, but if they can take some of those things away from that, that um, Denver game, then maybe they can really give themselves a good shot. This game is fascinating to me because I don't think we truly know what Loyola is yet. Like despite the fact it's this time of year, like, they played Syracuse really tough to a one-goal game in the Carrier Dome, and it happened a couple of months ago. And that is the toughest game that they've played to date. Now, it's not a knock on their schedule, more just a kind of description of what the women's lacrosse landscape is this year. Whereas if you didn't play maybe five teams across the top five in the country, you didn't really know what that upper, upper echelon is like until you play them. So this is Loyola's shot. Like, I will be I, – I have no idea what to expect – because I do think they have the talent to compete, but I don't know. But we just haven't seen them compete against this talent that often this year. So second time around, if you lose to Syracuse, if you tested them in the Dome by one, second time around, what do you take away from that? And how do, how do you learn how to win one of these games? That I, I, I don't think it's anything close to the Denver game. I think they run with them because I think that's their team yeah. and they trust it. And yeah. Jen Adams and, and Dana Dovey know what they have. And I think they trust it. And you're going to either... Win by running and gunning or lose it, lose by running and gunning. I mean, in that win for over JMU for Loyola, it was 18 to 8, by the way. Rosenzweig got yeah. six assists and 13 draw controls. <laughs> That's a day for someone that does a lot of the offensive scoring. They've got Fielder, Georgia Latch, Jillian Wilson, Katie Detweiler on defense, Caitlin Larson, 7.68 goals against average this year. And uh, it feels like, you know, we saw the JMU run back in 2018 where you sort of have everybody come together. You have an upperclassman lace squad of a lot of experience. This is Loyola's shot to do that, it feels like. You know, I'm not saying they're going to do yeah. that, but this is their run, and maybe things can come together for them. That's why I'm so high on them. And people will say, oh, you told me, oh, you hate BC. I'm like, no, I just like some of these other teams a lot that I think can challenge Boston College. And Loyola is one of the teams I just that don't. all year long that I think can do that. It's not that I don't like Boston College. I think that there are some other teams that really have you know, amplified and, to me, have what it takes to be able to get to that point.
There's Let's just say you've been picking against Boston College a lot more than most other people. That's all I'm saying. I picked against them once. Okay. I sure. Picked, okay. You have to beat them. That was it. That was the only time, and I've talked up all the other teams but Boston College because everybody. Well, you picked North Carolina when they we, played. Yeah, because North Carolina is the best team in the country. Yeah. And I'm just pointing that. I mean, you just picked against College them a couple of times. Entity. We know how great Charlotte. We don't have to talk about them more. We already know. I mean, I I think that we we all right. We watch the games. Charlotte North's incredible. She deserves to be. Yeah, she's Charlotte unbelievable. One of the best in the country. But anyway, so I think this. Is Let's be move great. on. We're, oh, we're moving. I do too. I. Yeah, no, no, no. I do. Th- I actually, I think that I honestly think that game may be the best game of the, the four. Yeah, I think so too. Like you said, if if it does go up and down, watch out. I don't know what's going to happen. That's going to be wild. You know. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, Syracuse this next game. Syracuse Northwestern can get that way too. Northwestern. Play- yeah, I mean, the first time. Yeah, the first time they played 16-15, one goal Northwestern win. I and I, I, I'd be hard. I think we're hard pressed to find an, another. A, to have something different happen. Like, if this, if somebody doesn't get to 15, 16 goals in this game, I will be shocked. Uh, I mean, first of all, Lauren Gilbert was seven goals the first time that they played. She just shined bright. And I, I don't know, they, Northwestern on their Instagram posted uh, questions like, name something that's faster than Lauren Gilbert. There's not much. I mean, she is. First step off the, uh, the free position, she is like lightning. It's hard to stop. So, if Syracuse fouls her and gives her op- opportunities for the eight meter, it's over. Like kind of like Charlotte North when she winds and fires, that's one way. Lauren Gilbert with that fast first step is another way to score. So that's something to keep an eye on. But for Syracuse, as kind of shaky as these first two games may have felt in terms of them getting here to the quarterfinals, Olivia Adamson may be the biggest story of that weekend for them if they go on a Final Four run. She had eight goals combined, five against Fairfield, which they needed all of them, and then three more against Princeton, which they needed all of them. And the freshman all of a sudden has a hat trick in four of her last six games. And so they've been looking for pieces to fill in with some of the different injuries that they've had. Maybe Adamson is one of the answers that they're finally finding here late in the year. And Kimber Howard coming off 11 saves against Princeton. She was shaky against Fairfield. Huge bounce back effort. And I think that's a huge momentum boost for her, knowing she's going to face a ton of shots against Northwestern. So Adamson and Howard for Syracuse are two, uh, I think, really big keys, along with all the knowns for the Orange. But those are two huge keys in this game. Yeah, and... You hold Princeton to nine goals, and that to me is big. Princeton's got a really good offense. That was their strength. That's why they won games this year was their offense, um, for better or for worse. So for Kimber Howard to come back after getting benched at one point in the Fairfield game and have that performance, double-digit saves, huge for her confidence moving forward. And uh, I, I'd imagine she'll be back in there, and, and they're going to ride with her until they can't anymore at this point. You know, Kayla Trainer's going to stick with her, and then if they need a, some life, yeah, they, they might take her out, but I think at this point she earned a lot of trust with that, and like you said, a lot of confidence. For sure. That makes a huge difference, especially this time of year. You look to the draw in this one, you got Mishowski and Jill Girardi, which should be a really good matchup because possession will be important in this game. Like you said, if it's going to be as close and high scoring as it's going to be, some of those extra possessions are going to matter a lot more. And, and Syracuse... They held Princeton, they stopped them a little bit more, but also you get the ball back too. So I think that the more they are able to do that, you keep the ball away from the Northwestern offense, which even without Izzy Skane has proven to be really potent this year, one of the best in the country, which if they have Izzy Skane, they're probably the top seed in the tournament. But still, they might be. But still, Northwestern gets to host this game too. You know, we've talked about it all year. I've talked to coaches about this all year, how hard it is to win there. It's going to be really hard for Syracuse to win there. I think they can do it, but I don't know if this is – after last year, of course, that things can always even out in a series like this. And you know that Syracuse beat that ride with Gary Gate as the head coach. Can Kayla Trainer, you know, cook up just a, a similar plan that Gate did after – Gate obviously acknowledging and knowing that Northwestern rides so well over his career. Can Kayla Trainer take stuff from that game, some of her own knowledge, of course, that she had at Boston College, and implement that too to, to do the same? Because you're not going to surprise Northwestern this time with that. You've got to do something different. And I think Trainer, obviously, she's done a great job with this team this year, and um, they've dealt with a lot of injuries. So now this is going to be her biggest test as a coach. Uh, yeah, for sure. And you know what? In this game, you have to be ready for the runs because both these teams are going to go on three, four, five goal runs. So you got to be ready for them. And I think both these teams know how to handle those. 
But I think that's a, always a calling card of these types of games. You saw the same thing with Boston College and North Carolina earlier in the year. you got to know how to handle the runs. And I think both these teams know how to handle it. And one more thing. Princeton had six yellow cards against Syracuse. And if you're not familiar with the women's game, it's four and on. A lot of penalties. It's a two-minute unreleasable. So once you get past four, that's a big deal. And to see Syracuse drawing those fouls is also – I know Princeton's defense, I talked about them before, not as strong as their offense – but Northwestern's got to be careful there because Syracuse will make you foul them. We saw that in the Stony Brook game for Syracuse earlier in the year as well, and Syracuse won yep. that too. So something else to keep in mind. Syracuse's offense, the way it moves, the way it flows, also can make the other team foul a little bit more. And I think that was part of the first matchup between these two as well. So Northwestern has to be able to play defense without fouling in order to be successful here too. All right, speaking of Princeton, uh, that Syracuse uh, loss for Princeton ended the legendary career of Chris Mm -hmm. Saylor. I had a chance to catch up with her to talk about that career and also get her feeling on what the rest of this tournament may look like. Obviously, she's a good person to ask. They played a lot of the top teams in the country. So listen to that interview now. So Chris Saylor, the now former Princeton head coach, joins us now. Uh, Chris, that's weird to say. How does it feel for you after Sunday? It is. Well, my contact track still goes through June 30th, so don't say former yet. The new coach hasn't been named. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's it's been pretty much a whirlwind since Sunday. Um, most of the kids, except for the seniors, um, the rest of the team pretty much moved out yesterday. So we got all got together at a local like smoothie place and hung out for a little bit. So that, that was fun before they took off, but there's a lot happening at Princeton this week. I mean, we've got reunions this weekend. We got a big senior student athlete banquet on Thursday night, and we've got a a senior dinner with the seniors and coaches. So it, it, um, it still feels like we're moving on in a typical way. I'm sure after great graduation, when everything quiets down on campus and I start to move out of the office, I'm sure it'll really hit me at that point. Right now, I'm just trying not to think about it and Fair. just going about what I would normally do this time of year. D- did you take a minute on Sunday as you walked off the field after that game or did you just focus on the team? took probably a half minute but again I knew like if I focused too much on it uh, it it would just you know send me over uh over the edge you know um was just really focused on the team and and you know wrapping up with them I thought we gave such a great effort on the field and it's just you know it's tough for the seniors to have their career come to an end I you know I know how much the team wanted it for them and Certainly uh, for me, too. And we were all thought we had a great chance to get to the quarters. So it was disappointing. But I I don't think any of us are disappointed with the season. We had an incredible season with so many highlights. Um, So, and you know, I think every every senior is leaving knowing that they left the, the jersey in a great place. You know, it has been a long stretch. It had been three years since we had been in postseason in 2019. And that's a long time to go, you know, in between postseasons. And, you know, so many of our players, 18 or 19 of them, took the year off so that they'd have a chance to come back and play again. And others made the decision to to stay in school because that felt like that was the right decision for them. And so everybody sacrificed uh, something. And, you know, just to have it go so well when when we got back and, um, you know, it, it is a long time to be away from competitive lacrosse. But I thought our kids handled it really well. And I'm just really proud of, of the whole team. When you went through the process of figuring out when this would be your last year, how much did the last couple of years play into it and, and how much what made this the, the right time to walk away? Yeah, I mean, I had been thinking about it, you know, it had been in my mind for, um, for, you know, a couple of years, I think when you get to, to my age in your career, you start thinking about what would might be the right time. I think, you know, I, I think I always wondered how I would handle having the free time and not going into the office every day. And, and ironically, I mean, COVID gave me a feel, a little bit more of a feel for what that lo- kind of life would be like to have more free time. And, I can't say that I didn't like it. (laughs) I mean, it was, you know, it was nice to have weekends. It was, you know, nice to have some more um, free time. And so, you know, it it helped me see that I could make the transition. Um, We'll see, you know, during that time, you were still working though. And uh, I knew what I was coming back to. We'll see if it's different uh, starting the fall. But 
Um, I just felt like the time was right for me. I never wanted to be a coach who felt like I stayed in it too long. Um, you know, I feel like I've had a great experience and, um, you know, I've had so many incredible memories and so much success there with my, my teams and my staff. So over the years, it just seemed though, that the time was right to, you know, hand it off to, to the new coach and, um, have the next era of Princeton lacrosse begin. What's the, the thing outside the, the wins and losses that you'll miss the most from, oh, from this yeah. job that you've held for so long? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the day to day in, in the office with my staff, I mean, yeah, I just love my staff. We have, we have so much fun, you know, it's, it's just great to, to go to work. I mean, a lot of people don't get to feel that in their careers. Right. Um, and the day to day with the team, you know, those magical practices out on 52, often under the lights where it's like, oh my God, you just, you feel like you could keep playing forever. Like you never want the practice to end. Um, I think that's what I'll miss really most of all those just days when we're practicing really well and really hard. And it just feels so great to be out there coaching um, even more than the games. Those are the things that, that I think I'll, I'll probably miss the most. What, what do you have planned? <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's the big question. And I, <laughs> I heard a great answer one day and it's like, whatever I feel like, you know, um, I, after, 36 years at this place and 41 coaching at, at some level, you know, I'm ready for a break. I'm going to be uh, moving with my partner to my place down in Rehoboth beach. So that's happening pretty sh soon in the next few weeks. So it's kind of crazy, um, you know, getting ready for that. And uh, I'm going to spend the summer just enjoying myself and, you know, getting, getting, uh, getting some time on the pickleball court and bike riding and playing some golf and just, um, you know, having fun with friends and, and, and family and just doing things that I like, I like to do, you know, and, um, I know the one thing, you know, on, on those, uh, on those weekends when everybody else is, is recruiting under the hot sun, I'll miss seeing everybody, but, I think I'll uh, I'll be okay when I'm sitting on the beach. That will definitely keep me busy over the next month or so, trying to transition from you know one house to uh, to another house, and you know, and and then we'll see. I've intentionally not made any definite plans for anything work related. My friends who were retired all tell me they don't know how they ever had time for work. They're so busy. There's so much going on. Um, so we'll see. I'm definitely going to stay connected with uh, with Harlem Lacrosse. You know, I'll, I'll definitely help out with the friends of lacrosse board at, at Princeton, you know, and, and have my hands, you know, I'm sure in a, in a couple of things along the way, but nothing definite at this point. You've seen this game in the, on the women's side evolve so much throughout your career. And I wonder now after you've seen all the evolution, especially really over the last 10 years, where do you see this sport going? Well, I mean, it's just getting more and more uh, the athleticism just is is off the charts um at at this point i think all the rules that were um brought in in the last three or five years have just created uh just a game that is so much fun to watch so exciting it it, it really prizes athleticism and and team play um so i think it really you know I, I don't know that it needs to go many new places now moving forward i mean it's really in a, in a great spot um, my hat's off to the rules committee chairs. I, I know that Julie Myers down in Virginia and Jen Adams at, at Loyola, they really ushered in so many new changes that have made the game more fun to play, have made it more logical for fans in the stands. Um, you know, I'm sure the skill is going to keep um, keep improving, um, but I, I think it's in a good place right now. So we'll see, though. There's always there's always things that that evolve. Um, but I, I think the game just needs to kind of settle where it is for a while because there have been so many changes. You guys challenged yourself in, in a big way. I think four or five of the teams that are left of eight, you guys had on your schedule at some point this year. How do you see the rest of this year shaking out? Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Uh, you know, the UNC Virginia score was a little, um, eye popping to me when I saw that, um, you know, I think UNC is just so talented and, and deep and they're just so strong across the board. Uh, you can never count out a, a Charlotte North uh, led BC either. Um, you know, I, I think it, the quarterfinal games are going to be really exciting. I'm so, it's so 
awesome that they're going to be on um, ESPNU all day long. Us lacrosse junkies, um, you know, can watch or set our uh, our DVRs. So I, I think we're going to get some pretty incredible games. Yeah, and I, you know, what we talk about the next evolution of the sport. I feel like this is it. It's the recognition from just the sports community of how exciting the women's game is. Yes. I would agree with that. I mean, you know, we've even seen that at our games, just how many people, the enthusiasm for watching the team compete, how many people come out to watch the games. I mean, you see the, uh, you know, UNC, BC or whatever it is that, you know, the games up at uh, Boston College that are bringing in thousands of people and uh, just how many games you can now stream on, on your TV or watch on the, you know, the different networks. Um, you know, there's so many great, opportunities to watch the game and uh it's such a beautiful game a fast game and uh, the the women who play it are so athletic and committed and skilled and it, it's great that it's um getting a, a really wide audience these days well chris you've been an important part of this game throughout your career we appreciate all your time over the, the seasons and congratulations on an incredible career at princeton thank you thanks so much travis so glad we got to hear from Coach Saylor. What an amazing career and packed full on the game and beyond. So I appreciate her taking some time to talk to us. Yeah, for sure. And uh, to, to Coach Saylor, enjoy the beach. Moving down to Bethany Beach in Delaware, a great spot to be. And so she deserves that after uh, 36 <laughs> terrific years on the side. Got to be nice, right? That's, that's, that's a nice little, <laughs> little gift, if you will. Um, for sure yeah but that'll wrap things up appreciate all our guests for coming on today we have more on thursday so thursday we'll really delve into the men's games as we look ahead to that weekend of course the women's games will be going on so we won't touch on that as much we got some good guests coming up for you on thursday with coach deluca matt branda talking about their tournaments as well so we've got a great week it's a great time of year isn't this fun it's the best, man. This is what this is why we do it all year long. It's for May, and you get only a couple weeks of it. The weather's great. Uh, I mean, the weather wasn't great this past weekend for some of these games, but it should be. It looks like, I think, good this weekend in both Columbus and on Hempstead uh, and out on Long Island. So, be like 95. Pro- yeah, really hot. It, wow. uh, that's where the depth matters. This is why you, you get third and fourth line midfielders that play in, in the beginning of February because you're going to need them now. Yeah, I was always taught when we had our first day of football, they said, drink before you're thirsty. So if you're a lacrosse player, you have a game this weekend, just start drinking. Words of wisdom. Or you even get thirsty, just start drinking water. That's my only word of advice after this show. I'm thirsty right now. So oh. we're going to go get to that and appreciate you guys joining us. Travis and Tom, we thank you so much all season long. We'll continue to roll on here with the NCAA tournament, uh, but that'll do it for our show. We'll see you next time.